Feels a lonely canyon high above the desert land. They call it Chicote. The flame strikes the steel. A cloud conceals the final stand. And the noble fall of the people be dear. Stay safe, stay warm. Hey, Bill here with Chicote and Nono. It's not Tom Selleck. Mustache, Hawaiian shirt. I can see how you could get confused. I'm not going to try to sell you a reverse mortgage. Uh, I'm up here at the Anthem uh, Veterans uh, Memorial today. And the reason is I got a knife recently. It's a Camelus, World War II era. Very nice knife. And they're an interesting company. Um, this memorial, it, uh, it's set up for November 11th. November 11th, Veterans Day. Veterans Day used to be Armistice Day. It was the 11th, uh, the 11th day, the 11th month, the 11th hour, and that's what makes this memorial kind of interesting. It's how, how it all connects. So I wanted to show it to you. Um, this is up here in Anthem, Arizona, and it's kind of interesting. You have these columns. Each column represents uh, a segment of the armed forces. I happen to be in front of the Marine Corps one here, and uh, there are concentric circles through the columns. And at a certain time of year, November 11th, the sun will shine through those and illuminate the great seal of the United States of America. So it's kind of an interesting memorial. Uh, Camelus, Camelus Cutlery, the Model 99. If you've ever gotten around a campfire and you've talked about pocket knives, people always say, oh, if I had my 99 again, or if I could get a hold of a 99. Well, uh, I did get a hold of one. And they're a pretty special company. They were a special company before they went out of business. Uh, during World War II, the Army and Navy used to issue an award for production, and they produced uh, millions and millions of knives for the war effort. Out of 85,000 companies that wanted that award, only 5% actually ever achieved it, and Camelus is one of them. So a pretty special, the Army-Navy E Award. Uh, if you know anything about World War II, you would know what that is. Um, awarded for production. But I'm going to show you around the uh, memorial. I'm going to show you this knife, so stick with me. It's going to get pretty interesting. Okay, so these are the rings that go through the columns. And on November 11th, the sun will shine through these rings, through these columns, and it will illuminate the Great Seal of the United States. And there it is. And so only on November 11th will the sun shine directly through those rings, hit this circle. And it's supposed to happen for the next 500 years. So in 500 years from now, you should come out here, see if it still works. Okay, let's do uh, let's do an official unboxing here. Let's get in this son of a gun here. wrapped in 
bubble wrap there for protection and shipping. And look at that. That is pretty cool. Wow. Holy cannoli. And I'm going to check it for the marks. So there it is right there. You can see the famous 99 mark on there. You flip the other side over. It's Camelus. Now you're probably wondering who Camelus is. I'm going to try to explain that to you. Camelus was a Roman emperor. He was a veteran of many wars and Rome didn't really treat him that well. And as Rome fell the second time, he rallied what was left and he actually saved Rome and he became the second founder of Rome. Emperor Camillus, great guy. That's who this knife company is named after. Uh, the old Model 99. But there it is. I hope you can see that with the magnifying lens. Uh, I can't believe I actually got one of these. This is going to be fantastic. Stay safe, stay warm, stay free. All right. ago that our boys from Jefferson left for training. Although we hated to see them leave, we were a little proud that ours was one of the first National Guard companies to be called up. There were 103 of our boys in the outfit, so it was quite a chunk out of our small population. We had a little parade for them, and mothers cried a bit, but we all thought nothing had happened to them. This was not our war. The chaps wouldn't dare attack us. Hitler couldn't cross the Atlantic. The boys went to camp and drilled and trained with their old equipment and wrote cheerful letters home about how they could whip anybody when they got their guns. But after a few months, they were a little better trained than the rest of the companies, so they were loaded onto transports and sent out to the Philippine Islands, 5,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean. They arrived safely and soon settled down to life in the tropics. Then came the stab in the back. I suppose, like most people in other towns all over America. We may have been excited first, but then we became a little more silent and a little more grim because we knew the face of every boy. We watched them grow up. There wasn't a single family in town that wasn't kin to one of the boys in Company A. After the first shock was over, we settled down to life more or less as usual. Mrs. Delaney wrote her John to watch out for malaria because he'd had a touch of it when he was nine. Mrs. Ross baked a cake to send to Milton, but he never got it. And we all went to church more often. We knew some of our boys would die. We didn't know which ones, of course, but everybody tried not to think about it. But fighting went on just the same. Last winter came the first telegram from the War Department. Alton took it off the wires just before closing time. It was for Mr. and Mrs. Todd, who lived on a farm just outside town. 
Elton didn't want her to deliver it by himself, so he stopped by and got the minister to go with him. Everybody was asleep as they drove up to the Todd's little home. Mr. Todd is over 60, and the missus is not much younger. With their son, they farmed about 50 rich acres of wheat, and Richard had gone two nights a week to the armory. Elton said they looked very lonely as they came out from the porch that night to get the news. The minister read the telegram aloud. Your son, Richard Todd, killed in action. For a day or so, everybody resolved to buy more bonds and to work harder. But the Todds lived on the edge of town, and we didn't see them very often, so we lapsed back into our old ways a bit. We laid off at the factory for a day, wasted our tires, skipped a week on our bonds. We felt like most other towns. The war was a long way off. But the war was to come even closer to us. Manila was evacuated and bombed. Everybody stuck by their radios. We were thinking about our boys. So Christmas came and went, and everybody tried to have a good time thinking about the next Christmas when the boys would be back. Their letters all said, don't worry, Mom, or we're doing all right in this scrimmage. And we had our heroes to celebrate, too. We learned that Steve Johnson, one of our young lawyers, had led the boys in an attack that netted 60 Japs. Everybody congratulated Mrs. Johnson, and it was really something to talk about for a few days. But then the retreats began. We knew that things must be getting worse because their letters were getting more cheerful. The boys were trying to keep our spirits up. There were more telegrams. There was one for old man Landry about his grandson Jamie, who'd been an orphan. One for the Whites. And the Greenbergs. And two for the Dunlaps. The two Dunlap boys had always stuck together. The war was certainly getting closer to us now. We were in the middle of America. We couldn't be bombed. But there was a war right here on our front step. And it came right in the door on the day that Batan fell. We knew that most of the boys had escaped to Corregidor, but all other news was scarce. Somebody started a cruel rumor that they'd all been killed. Though we tried to stop it, people picked up scraps of gossip and passed them on as gospel truth. Poor Mrs. Stone was told three times that her boy was dead. But it wasn't true, so now she just doesn't believe any rumors only what is official from the government. Somebody, instead of hanging out black crepe, put a flag out on the front of their house. And soon they were all over town. We were worried and proud at the same time. But now the fighting was fiercer and more deadly. It was a terrible blow to Dr. Harper that his boy died on the operating table. Killed by a bomb from a Jap plane. Often we got a little desperate in our thinking. How could we give them the things they needed? We wished we could take the comforts we were enjoying in our homes and carry them out to the tropics and give them to our soldiers, as we did when they were kids at the Boy Scout camp down on the river. The war was here now, right here with us, in every home in town. This was what we had to fear and what we had to fight. But we could only work a little harder and give and hope and pray. It couldn't get much worse, but it did get worse. On 
the 6th of May in a hell of heat and fever and fighting, Corregidor Fortress surrendered. All the rest of our boys, 92 of them, were swallowed up in one day. They were prisoners of war at the treacherous mercy of the Japs. They were missing in action. We didn't know how many of them were dead. All that night, our people wandered around the streets, from the post office to the courier, down to the depot to get the papers off the train, trying to get some news, trying to get or give some comfort. But very little was to be had. This was war. War brought right here to our little town, forced upon us by an aggressor whom we had helped and tried to trust in the past. Naturally, we couldn't do much of anything for a few days. We couldn't work. We couldn't even sleep. Our two remaining doctors had their hands full, treating people for shock and for old sicknesses, brought back to life by worry and grief. But everybody took it bravely. Mrs. Deering said my boy would be fighting now if he'd had guns and food for his men. The Todds, who would have to farm alone now, said, it makes us realize how little we've done to help them. We all wondered at one time or another how the rest of America felt. Those who had not lost sons and brothers and fathers, but just a battle. Some of us were disillusioned and some of us were just plain mad. We tried to make some plans. A committee phoned the Red Cross in New York to see if there was any way to get letters to prisoners of war under the Japanese. And the rumor mongers tried to start up again, telling harrowing tales of Japanese atrocities to prisoners. But they didn't get very far. Our minds weren't idle now, so we didn't have time for rumors. We knew the enemy and what he was like. And then things started to happen. Our salvage drives took on new meaning to us because our boys could have used the things we'd been wasting. We didn't keep for ourselves anything that could help our soldiers. And we realized in a way how lucky we were. We were a little ahead of the rest of America. We had learned the full meaning of this war because we had lived with its pain. There was no doubt in our minds now, no complacency, no indecision, no time to think of our own troubles, just time to fight to work overtime. A lot of the kids went out to the farms to help harvest the crops. Hands were important now, more important than experience. Our high school teacher, a filling station man, and Bill Daniels organized a fix-it committee. They were all handy with tools, so they worked after hours on refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, automobiles. In that way, an aeroplane factory got two more mechanics they needed to make the planes we didn't have at Batan. A shipyard got a welder who helped launch a ship three days ahead of... And there was one more man in America making guns. We all either walked or stayed home and gave up our tires so that our army could roll and our planes could land. We didn't realize how many things we could do that we hadn't done before. We made over our clothes so our soldiers could keep warm. We didn't waste electricity. And the smelters a hundred miles away had more power to make steel. We sent the Navy six pairs of good binoculars. And an access raider was sunk in the Atlantic. And we didn't spend our money either. We put it to work to get our boys back home. We weren't going to face them again after all they'd been through without being able to say with a clear conscience, we did everything we could to help you. Not a little bit or more than we thought we had to, but everything, all day in every way we could. And in spite of the gnawing grief that was always inside us, we began to feel a little elated. There was joy in our work because we knew we could face our boys. To those who had given arms and legs and eyes, we could say that we gave not only our sickening luxuries and comforts, but our money, our thought, our skills, our work and our sweat. It was a different town that watched our second troop march off to war. There were almost 200 of them this time. Some of them weren't as husky as others, but they could help their pals. 
Yes, we were a different people. We knew that through our efforts, these boys had had guns this time. Better guns than the enemy. They'd have food to sustain them, medicine to keep them well. They'd have fast planes, tough tanks, and fleets of ships to keep them supplied. They'd be better than any enemy. Their weapons would be stronger because all the ingenuity and mechanical skill of our whole great nation would be behind them. These boys would never have to surrender because we at home would never let them down. We knew that all America would learn what we had learned the hard way, that this is everybody's war. Not war for an outpost here or a naval base there, but war for every foot of American soil, every home and field, for all our friends, for all our kin. A war without compromise and without quarter. A war that must end only one way, in freedom for the world and for our little town.